Welcome to the Self Girl Nerds Podcast. I'm your host, Marie, a courage coach, creative soul, and adventure seeker. Since through hiking the Pacific Crest Trail in 2019, I'm on a mission to help you embrace your most confident self so you can achieve your dreams too. If you're eager for deep conversations, big questions, and meaningful connections, join me on the quest to discovering how we can create a more magical and memorable life. Hello, nerds. How are you? I'm really good. Today, we are diving into the book Existential Kink, Unmask Your Shadow and Embrace Your Power by Carolyn Elliott. This book was life-changing for me, so that's why I want to tell you about it in today's episode. And by the way, just note I'm also filming a video uh, for Instagram, so if you're listening to this and you want to see my face, then head to Instagram and you'll be able to watch that as a video. So first I'm going to tell you about how I got into this, how I found this book. And then I'm going to ask you five questions to help you understand the premise and help you do some introspection and see how what she teaches might apply to you. I'm going to give you lots of personal examples as well. Uh, Before we jump in, I just want to remind you that my program, The Courage to Start New, starts today. Uh, This week is the introduction week, so it's not too late to join us. Uh, If you're feeling called to uh, realign, if you're approaching a season of your life where you think there's going to be big changes, big transitions, and you want support, you want to be surrounded by other people who are also stepping into the void, um, approaching scary decisions, then this is going to be the place for you. Uh, We start today. It's going to last eight weeks and we're going to meet every week. There's no meeting this week. It's just introduction. But next week we start meeting live for eight weeks. And by the end of our time together, you'll have such a a more grounded sense of self, a clearer idea of what you want, who you are, the parts of you and your desires that you have been repressing are going to be out uh, shamelessly, unapologetically, because we're going to create a space where there is no judgment and you can come as you are and explore what's what you're being called towards, no matter how scary or unusual or outside the norms it might be. So just go to selfgrowthnerds.com slash courage and you'll be able to sign up there. And as soon as you sign up, you'll have access to the platform and be able to meet the other travelers. All right, so let's get back to Existential Kink by Carolyn Elliott. So I was... With my coach, my previous coach, Chris Hale, go check him out, the only Chris Hale on Instagram. And I brought up a situation with him that I had noticed and thought was interesting. The situation was that I was at my friend's house and her husband asked me to get something in the fridge. I don't remember what it was, but I just opened the fridge and I didn't see it right away. Let's say it was like a pot of yogurt. I don't know. Get me the yogurt. So I open the fridge and I don't see the yogurt. And instead of really looking for it, I noticed that I was like, oh, I don't know where it is. And I wanted to go back to him and ask him, where is it exactly? It's like this helpless, confused child part of me that showed up. And I noticed in the moment, oh, okay, yeah, I do this. I do this. More often than I like to admit how interesting. And in the moment, I just I just thought, no, Marie, just look for the damn yogurt pot. Look for it. And I found it because, you know, fridge, a fridge is only so big. <laughs> so I found the yogurt. But then I brought this moment up with my coach, Chris, and he said, you know what? That reminds me of existential kink. In the book, she would say that you actually there's a part of you that gets off on helplessness a part of you that loves for for you to to need others. And I was like, "Huh, that's really interesting." And the next day, I think I had a my bookstore send me a random $30 gift card. 
to order a book online. So I just thought, let me buy that book. I don't know if I would have gone and got it if I didn't have received that random gift card in the mail. So I received the book a week later and uh, started reading it. And in if that was, I think, three weeks ago, and it's changed many things already. So disclaimer, <laughs> I'm not a fan of the writing. I don't think it's great writing, but I definitely believe it's worth reading if you're someone who is spiritual. If you're not woo-woo at all, you probably are not going to enjoy it. Okay, It's very out there. So you have to, to read this book with a playful, open-minded mindset where you don't take things too seriously and you're in a mood where you're like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm willing to try new things. Okay, so I, I have my notes in front of me and when I was preparing them, I was like, I could speak about this for hours and hours because it's so fascinating, but we're going to try to keep it simple. And some of the practices that I've learned in this book, I'm going to integrate in the program that uh, that's starting today, the courage to start new. So if this episode is like resonates with you and pokes at your curiosity, definitely join the program. So the main concept of the book is that what you don't like about yourself or about your current life situations, well, there's a part of you, a shadow part of you that actually loves it in an unconscious, erotic love kind of way. There's a quote that she shares many times in the book from Carl Jung, and it's until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. So this is really what this is about, is uh, uncovering all the unconscious forces that are messing up with you in order to create what she calls a unified mind, where there's no internal split. I often talk about the internal split, where you're not like, oh, why is it that I can't do this? No, you know. There is no fight within you. Like, I want to do this, but I can't get, like, I want, I want to stop smoking, but I can't get myself to stop smoking, for example. There's like an inner fight. Well, the, the goal of this existential kink work is to get rid of that and have a unified will, if you, if you will. <laughs> okay, so if you're confused right now, that's totally fine. I'm going to give you a bunch of examples to make sure that you, you get the gist, okay? But also, I definitely suggest reading the book and diving deep into it. Even I think I'm going to read it again to integrate it more deeply. And it's also going to be a book that I go back to a, a lot in the coming years. So the first question, I have five for you, okay? The first question is... What are bad habits, and bad is in quotes, right? What are bad habits that you have and that you can't shake? So my, my example that I gave you earlier about helplessness, I'm going to take that, that one. It shows up in, in, in a variety of ways in my life. For example, if I, I know I need to take an appointment with my doctor, I make it so complicated. I'm like, I don't know. I'm being a bit petty, right? Helpless. I don't know. I don't know how to do it. It's, uh, I don't know. And what existential kink would say here is, hmm, I actually love being in that helplessness. Maybe I have a fantasy to want to be led. Maybe I just really want to be taken care of. I want someone to just do it for me, and I get off on the idea of that. And instead of being ashamed of that, of, of the idea that I might actually love to just, I don't have to do anything, everything is done for me, instead of being ashamed of that, what she suggests is to own that, to love that part of you, to let it come to life instead of repressing it. Because if you repress it, it remains in control behind the scenes because it wants to be alive, right? So it's going to try to find ways to show up. 
like the fridge example, like the doctor's appointment example. And I'm going to be like, oh, why do I keep doing this? Well, that's because I'm not allowing it to just be. And if you're ever going to release a bad habit, what she says is you must first understand and acknowledge what you gain from it. The pleasure that you actually gain from that. And I'm not telling you to just stop looking for things in the fridge and order, like give orders to your loved ones to go get the yogurt pot or uh, get someone to, to, to take all of your appointments for you. That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, or she's telling you in the book, to go to a space in your mind, heart and body where you acknowledge that there's a part of you that actually wants this so bad, okay? Another bad habit that I have is people-pleasing. Like, let's say I'm with a group of people and we want to go out to a restaurant. I don't like deciding where we're going to eat. I don't want to be the one who chooses the restaurant because I don't want others to be disappointed and it being my fault. I know it wouldn't be, but like that's how I would interpret it. So I would rather that they choose. Now, if we look at this from an existential kink lens, is actually I really want to do as I'm told. I want to please. It brings me pleasure to please. T- to just do what needs to be done for others without thinking about my own preferences. That brings me pleasure in a dark way. Dark, twisted, kinky way, she would say. <gasps> So Carolyn, the author, she suggests getting still, getting really relaxed and thinking about what it would be like to just own that, to own that I love to please, that I just want to do as I'm told, just want to be a good girl, (laughs) just want to be a good girl and notice the sensations in your body, okay? It is intense. You're basically saying, yeah, this is true. I love this. I don't hate it like I pretend that I do. You know, because with self-improvement, we're like, oh, I don't want to fuck people pleasing. We want to we want to get rid of our people pleasing tendencies. But she's telling us to do the opposite in a way that the only way we're actually going to free ourselves from those people pleasing tendencies is by first going to a place where you're like, okay, stop. I need to stop pretending that I don't like to please people. I love it in a deep, deep way. And that leads to what she calls embodied unity. Okay, you stop lying to yourself. And again, none of this is conscious. Obviously, consciously, you don't want to people please. It's like, usually when I talk about this, I say this comes from your social conditioning. You've learned growing up that if you please people, you're going to receive their love. And so what we're looking at through this work is, yeah, you've learned to get pleasure actually from the unconsciously. And that's why you can't shake that habit. That's why you can't just stop people pleasing is because you love it. You're addicted to it in a way in an erotic kind of way. Okay, so far are you following me? Let's move to the second question. So that was, the first question was, what are bad habits that you have and cannot shake? And look, look at what ways you might actually really love them. Question number two, what are you disgusted of in other people? Or what do you judge really harshly in other people or in yourself? What are you ashamed of? Now, the one that came up for me is laziness. I catch myself judging people who I consider are being lazy. Uh, People that don't work hard, that don't take responsibility, that are too dependent on others. I have, sometimes I have feelings of disgust towards that. But everything that irritates us in others is in us as well, in some way but we repress it and shame it. So when I turn turn it around and look at myself, I want to do nothing. So there are moments where I just don't want to get in the shower. There are moments where, you know, when I open a cupboard to get a cup, 
I just don't close the cupboard. Or I let like my dirty cup lie around in the corner of the room for two days. And I, I let the dirty laundry pile up. There are moments like this where it's just, it's stronger than myself. I just want to be messy. I just want to be lazy. I feel lethargic and not, like I'm not compelled at all to close the cupboard. I'm not compelled to wash my clothing. I'm not compelled to um, <laughs> to uh, do the dishes, okay? And I hate this. The, the, the ego says, this part of you, Marie, is inconvenient. It's irresponsible. It's unacceptable. You must change that. You must hide it. No one must see this. So you perform who you believe you have to be. Okay, I have to be a responsible adult who washes their clothes, washes their dishes, goes in the shower, keeps their apartment clean. The image of me that is acceptable. Now, existential kink says you got to remove all the shame by flipping the situation on its head. And looking at how you actually might really love and get off on doing nothing and being surrounded by a mess turns you on in a way. You crave it. I imagine the situation of just lying on the beach, reading my book with people bringing me cocktails all day. Or like if I open a cupboard to get a cup, uh, someone comes behind me and closes the cupboard for me. Or even, I, I don't even have to get up to get the cup. Someone brings me the cup. The cup appears in front of me. I get off on that. And the ego says, whoa, 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 this is wrong. Who do you think you are? You think that you're better than the others? You think you're a princess? But existential king says, pause, set the ego aside. For a moment, let yourself go there shamelessly. See what happens. How could you make that fantasy happen in reality in some way? Play with that. An example from the book. I'm not going to share where that led me personally because it's quite private. I was going to say I was surprised with what came up for me. Um, but an example from the book that she gives is uh, someone who loves being late. Uh, doesn't love being late. Someone who's late all the time. They don't love it. They want to change that because it's inconvenient. Everyone in their life tells them, stop being late. It's so annoying. What she says is they actually have a desire to be in power, to make people wait for them because it makes them feel important. And that's all unconscious. Consciously, if, if that's you, if you tend to be late, you'd be like, oh no, I just have poor time management skills. But what she says, what she challenges you on is actually there's something deeper than that, something unconscious, an unconscious desire to make people wait for you because that makes you feel more special. You get off on that. So what she says is just own it. Get off on that in your imagination and then maybe you go sign up to burlesque dance classes, for example. So you can stir up massive sensations in your audience. Or maybe you look into BDSM. Maybe you find a consenting partner to flog, she writes. To let people feel your power and your importance in a conscious manner. And that's what's really important here. Your desire for power and for importance is in in you but you don't let it come out and so it shows up in ways that you have no control over or that it seems like you have no control over like being late you're like why can't I shake this bad habit so annoying that's because you don't allow the unconscious to become conscious because there is shame there so when you remove the shame you'll be surprised to discover what comes up and you can think creatively how you can fulfill that desire in reality, okay? Question number three, and they all weave in together. They're all similar, but I came, came up with them just to help you think of situations in your own life that you can work with. And by the way, don't work with intense trauma. Like, 
Just use like little annoyances in your life. Don't also don't work with like a situation where situations where there's a lot of sorrow or grief, like those big, big, big emotions. Try to try to steer clear of them for now. Just take smaller uh, inst- uh, examples. Okay, so question number three: What's something you want but cannot seem to get to the level that you want it? Like, what's a goal that you wish you could reach? Is it losing weight? Is it uh, running, running, uh, getting fit, running a marathon? For me, my example is I want a larger audience. Uh, I want a larger audience and I want more clients. My, it's funny how my email list has stayed around the same number for like a whole year, for the last year. It hasn't gone up. And ask yourself the question, in what ways do I actually do not want this at all? I say I want a larger audience. I say I want to grow my email list. But in what ways do I actually do not want this at all? And have a conversation with this part of you that does not want this. The part of you that does not want to lose weight. The part of you that does not want to get fit. The part of you that doesn't want a larger audience with more clients. This was super revelatory for me because that part of me said, and she said it right away, but you've got to be in like a relaxed space of mind for, for this channel to this conversation with yourself to happen. She said, Ugh, I, I wish I could stop success coming your way because it's going to take so much of our time and we won't be able to be lazy and helpless anymore. We're going to have to step into like a, our position as, a, as an expert. It's going to take effort. We might displease people as well. You know how much we hate this. We can't bear it. <laughs> and then sit in how true that feels. For me, it was kind of like a slap in the face. Ouch. Yes, I want success. I want to be a more of a leader with a larger audience, but at the same time, I dread it because of the responsibility it's, it, it, it might be. And it would be, actually. The more power you have, the more responsibility you have. How much work, how much effort... I'm scared of that. A part of me unconsciously is scared of that and believes that if I keep my world smaller, then it's more manageable. Then I can keep indulging in my laziness and my helplessness patterns. So in what ways are you Hmm. ensuring you won't get what you want and why? Again, acknowledge what you what you would lose if you truly got what you wanted that you're holding on to. I'm going to rephrase this to make it clear. If you get what you really want, what are you going to lose? What kind of comfort are you going to lose that's really important for you right now that you get off on? Okay. Let's move to question number four. How do you self-sabotage or slow yourself down? This is really the same thing we just talked about, but using different words. So for me, another example is self-doubt. I overthink a lot about what's right or wrong. What should I do? Am I a good person? Is this a bad idea? Like seeing things in a binary way. That's one of the first things that my therapist said to me is you're, all, you're an all or nothing person. And I've made a lot of progress there, but it still shows up. I doubt my own judgment. It's like, is this right or is this wrong? <laughs> I want someone to tell me what to do. I want someone to, uh, I want external validation so bad. I want people to tell me, yes, this is right. Go for it. That's why I spent a lot of money hiring coaches, signing up to courses. A lot of it was money well spent, but there was some of it that was like, oh, Marie, this is just you indulging in your self-doubt. So I could have saved myself some money if I'd done this work earlier. That's fine. Um, so instead of telling yourself, 
or instead of telling myself, I, I shouldn't need external validation, which is what I've done, right, in my self-improvement work, I've done mindset work on that, on not needing external validation. Instead of doing that, existential king says, remove all the shoulds. There's no more, I shouldn't need external validation. And just admit that you love, you get off on uncertainty. You're afraid of deep conviction. You love being confused, being undecisive. Because you get off on external validation. You just deeply, deeply want to be told exactly what to do. And if I am decisive, if I know what I want and I know where the yogurt pot is, then I lose access to this deep pleasure of mine. Do you see what I mean? If I'm like, I don't care what you think. I know what to do. I know what I want to do is right, is the right thing for me. Then this unconscious part of me that gets off on external validation it loses out. She loses out. And that's why we can't shake that habit, right? Got to let that part of you live and be in total loving approval if you don't want it to take over behind the scenes, okay? You cannot police your pleasure. You cannot limit your pleasure. You're like, no, no, this is inconvenient. I cannot get off on external validation. This is, this is, no, this is not what I want, but this is, what, this, is, this is the truth that's lying in you. Or for you, it might be different. It's probably different for you. Or you might deeply resonate to this because I know many, many of us women uh, are similar in that we, we doubt ourselves. We doubt our own judgment. And we're like, oh, I don't know what to do. I just don't know what to do. What should I do, please? And you ask all of your friends. You ask everyone, what should I do? What should I do? And that's because... And again, take that if it fits. Take that if it feels true in your body. But for me and my body, it was like, fuck yes. It's because I love this. I, I love being, receiving the validation externally. Okay, so now in the theme of not limiting your pleasures, I'm going to ask you the fifth and last question. And I'm going to reassure you again that if you feel confused, that's fine. This book is a mindfuck. And I may not, I'm probably not explaining the concept as accurately as Carolyn Elliott does in her book. So if you're curious, go get the book or download the audiobook and reread. <laughs> reread until you get it, if you're interested. Okay, so the fifth question is what's your havingness level? That was one of the concepts I love the most in the book. And let me explain what it means. Your havingness level is how much good stuff you allow yourself to have before your ego says, whoa, 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 this is too much. This is too good to be true. I don't deserve this much, this much joy. I don't deserve this much money. I don't deserve this much, what, this much pleasure. Um, in a spin class a few months ago, I remember the teacher, you know, spin teachers, they have all these cheesy things that they tell you to motivate you. And one of them said, you deserve all the good that comes your way. And I don't know why, but I just started crying. I'm just riding my bike, crying. And I'm like, yeah, I deserve all the good that comes my way. This is not how we have been socialized. And depending on, on what you have experienced growing up, your havingness level is going to be different. Um, but we, what we do is we unconsciously put a ceiling on what feels comfortable for us to have. A certain amount of love. Like if, if you have been accustomed as a kid to only be loved in a certain way, 
then this is what's familiar for you. Let's just take numbers to keep it easy. Let's say your parents, your caregivers only loved you half the time, then this is what's familiar for you to be only loved half the time or for half of who you are. And so if someone loves you for all that you are, you're like, oh, this doesn't feel safe. It feels icky. Get away. It's like, oh, I don't want to be with a good man. I feel more comfortable with a bad, a bad boy. <laughs> uh, just because that is familiar. And our body is programmed for homeostasis. So that, that just means going back to what it knows best. Okay. Uh, let's say you're, you're only comfortable with a certain amount of pleasure. Maybe you grew up in a religious household that put a lot of value on sacrifice, where it was not right to, uh, to laugh too much, to have too much fun. You needed to be serious, to put in the work. I don't know. That's not my reality, but I'm trying to think of examples. So if you go above a certain amount of pleasure, then you might feel a lot of shame. That's your having less level. You can only have a certain amount of love. You can only have a certain amount of pleasure. Another example is an amount of money. Let's say you've always been used to a certain level of money, then when you get more than that, it can be freaky. Or just having money can make you feel uncomfortable. If you grew up in scarcity, you might do things like, oh, if you have an extra cash in your account, you might spend all the extra that you have because you don't think you deserve such abundance. That's all unconscious, right? When I made $100,000, I had a freak out moment. I was like, I never made this much money. Um, I don't know. This, to me, this is a lot. I think, I, I think it depends. Uh, for some people, that's not, that's not much. <laughs> But for me, where I live, and that's, that's a lot. So your nervous system has to get accustomed to this amount of money. Uh, this amount of pleasure, this amount of love, until it becomes the new normal, until it becomes your new baseline. Now I feel good about $100,000. That's why I was able to do it the, the, the year after as well. But if you don't do the work, then you're going to sabotage yourself. If you don't do the work, then you're not going to stay with the partner who loves you for all that you are. You're not going to let yourself have all the pleasure that, that we all deserve. You're not going to let yourself have the money that you want to have if you don't learn to handle the, the discomfort of, of what's outside the familiar for you. Again, if this is how you've been conditioned, your unconscious will want to go back to what's familiar, will do everything in its power unless you rewire your brain. And that's part of the work that we're going to do in the courage to start new. That is what I've been trained for in coach training is to rewire your neuro pathways and to get more comfortable with new ways of being, new ways of thinking so that you can expand your capacity to hold more, to be more, to have more. We're going to work on that. So if that's something that you know you need to work on, Go to selfgrowthnerds.com slash courage and I will teach these tools in the next eight weeks. So in conclusion, this work of using erotic pleasure to deconstruct shame and make the unconscious conscious, I started doing uh, with the book Unbound by Kasia Urbaniak last year. And it has led to massive changes in my life. Some of them I've shared with you. Some of them I have not because they're too private. Um, but I can tell you it has led to major ego death. It, it has killed the idea of who I thought I was. The personality that we all, all of us construct uh, has been challenged. And that has allowed me to become more of who I am deep down in my core. And I want this for you as well because it is so liberating and it makes it so much easier for me to breathe and just be. 
Okay, the more shame I burn down, the more free and alive I feel. And that's what I want to do with you in the courage to start new is to burn down the shame. See where you have shame about parts of you and to just burn it down as much as we can in a non-judgmental space. Because one thing I've learned about shame is it thrives in silence without witnesses. But as as soon as you bring up what you're ashamed of in public, you bring it up into the light and you are accepted with that part of you, you are told this is okay or what happened to you was wrong, then the shame can start dissipating. It's kind of like if you are, I love this example, if you are bullied on a school bus and and no one speaks up, then you integrate what happened as shame. But same situation, get bullied in the school bus, but an older kid stands up and tell your bully what you're saying is wrong. She doesn't deserve to hear this. If you're taken care of in that moment, if someone stands up for you and witnesses what happens, witness, I mean, witnesses what happens and stand, stands up for you, then the shame cannot grow. Because it's in the open light, okay? And that's what you, what you might not have been able to do in the past, but that's what I want. That's part of the work that I do with my clients. And you know what? The more shame I burn down in my life, the more creative inspiration I have. I, I am on fire like with content coming out of me, writing, creating. It's amazing. I have more libido. I have more energy in the day-to-day. So if you feel stuck creatively, if you feel down on yourself, if you feel disconnected from yourself, always have low libido, low battery, you might be storing shame and that's what might be making you feel heavy and disconnected. So I highly recommend reading this book. Uh, I also recommend reading Unbound by Kasia Urbaniak. Both of them talk about burning down the shame. Um, I recommend signing up to my program, The Courage to Start New. And I also recommend getting a therapist to work on these things with. This is important work. This is important work. But yeah, for different different uh, levels of budget, read the book, join the program. My program is $220. Or, or work with a therapist that can work with these kinds of things. I said a therapist, but therapist or a coach or any anyone who can do this kind of work that you trust and that you feel safe with. All right, that's it for today. I did my best explaining the concepts of this book. Obviously, it's not perfect. Let me know if you have any questions. Um, if you read the book, if you want to talk about what came up for you what realizations that you had, insights that you had, just DM me on Instagram at selfgrowthnerds. I would love to hear from you. I love to talk about my favorite books. So hit me up. All right. And again, the link to join the courage to start new is selfgrowthnerds.com slash courage. And I hope to see you on the other side. Bye, everyone. If you love what you're hearing on the Self Growth Nerds podcast and you want individual help finding a new direction for your life and developing the courage to make your dreams a reality, you have to check out how we can work together on selfgrowthnerds.com or message me on Instagram at selfgrowthnerds. My clients say they would have needed that support years ago. So if you're tired of feeling like you're wasting your life, Don't wait, get in touch now and I cannot wait to meet you.